Welcome back, everybody. I have the uh, pleasure of speaking with somebody who I'm truly giddy to speak to, uh, Bruce Dow. Bruce is an award-winning uh, actor. Uh, he's been on Broadway. He's been at Stratford. He's a lyricist. He's a writer. Uh, he's a composer. He's a uh, teacher. Uh, and I have many, many questions. So before I get ahead of myself, welcome, Bruce. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. This is lovely. And what a lovely introduction. I keep going, who's that guy? That He sounds interesting. <laughs> it's still you. Uh, and uh, let's let's give thanks where thanks is due. Um, we were introduced by uh, by a friend of yours, uh, Sujith Varighese, who is a wonderful, wonderful man. And he's been uh, really nice to me. And uh, he was on the program uh, uh, last week, I think, or maybe a couple of weeks ago. So uh, thanks to him. He is one of the most brilliant actors I know, and he's one of the kindest, kindest, truly gentle men in the world. So yeah, he's a treasure in my life. It's one of those people I wish I could spend more time with. We just, busy folks, you know. Yeah, you're both uh, a bit busy. And one of the reasons why we uh, we get a chance to talk to you is unfortunately your show, uh, Diana, on uh, Broadway, which is your fifth uh, you know, Broadway featured performance. But um, he, you were ready to go. You were done with tech. You were all set, and then COVID stopped uh, everything in its tracks. What's what's the news? Do you know when uh, things may open up? Um, it's uh, the when is is an interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. The but we were no, we were literally ten days before we opened, and so we were doing uh, rehearsals in the afternoon, minor changes, fixes, uh, and then. Uh, previews at night for audiences who were loving the show, uh, Diana, a true musical story at the Long Acre Theater. Uh, we will be back, evidently, is the plan. Um, the producers have been amazing. Our contracts are suspended, which is a strange state to be in. Um, <clears throat> but it's wonderful. It's rather than not having a job when all this yeah. is over. Um, we haven't received any official words, so I'm. this is my my supposition. Yeah. Um, I don't see Broadway coming back until at the earliest of the new year. Mm -hmm. um, probably not till next spring. I think it's it's uh, it's weird with New York. There's a number of factors. Uh, Broadway is somewhat supported by local people, uh, yeah. but it's largely a tourist industry. So yeah. not only do we need either a treatment or a vaccine. Mm -hmm. But people have to earn enough money to have disposable income to go on a trip, and then they would have to have that comfort level to sit close to a stranger. Yeah. So um, that's going to take some time. So I, I would say I'm, I'm guessing the earliest we go back to rehearsals would be January of next year, um, but it might be later than that. I don't know. Because it's also a commercial industry, so the idea of taking yeah. seats out to social distance doesn't work for Broadway. Yeah, and you need the audience. You need that energy. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's different on stage than yeah. on screen. Yeah. Um, well, I here's knocking on wood and keeping my fingers. I mean, I have total faith in our producers. They are working very hard to keep things going and keep us all connected. And uh, and their intention is to go forward and and hopefully hopefully sooner than later. I hope so. Um, musicals are my happy place. Uh, well, growing up, um, you know, I I love to sing. I'm not good at it, right. but I love to sing. Um, I love to act. Uh, I'm good at that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I'm a lyricist and I'm a poet, uh, and I, you know, that's kind of my my creative uh, outlet. And then um, coming to US uh, at the at the age of 14. Um, you go to school, and then I didn't have cable at that time. You go to school, you basically have it. I'm in Chicago. You go to school, and you come back. You have Cubs games. You have um, um, you have some cartoons, and then I got to watch a lot of musicals. So I my whole kind of introduction to the American experience was uh, the old uh, Hollywood, which is Fred oh Astaire, uh, Ginger Rogers, which is Gene Kelly. That's yeah. that's how I grew up. So. Yeah. My kids to this day know that anytime uh, I am down about something, I'm going to go. I'm going to put, turn on a musical of some sort, and good, I'm I'm back. I'm I'm lifted up. It's it's my happy place. So I want Broadway to come back very briefly. I need all of my musicals. <laughs> I think we're going to need it more than ever too. Just this yeah. is kind of giving us all a bit of a psychological kick in the private place. You know, it's uh, yeah, we're going to need that that uplift, which I think would be, yeah. And I totally get that. 
I totally get that. It's such a that Hollywood musical age was such a a unique fabricated world that they created that just gives a lot of peace. Yeah, it does. It's it's uplifting. It's a very different energy, um, and we we need it. And uh, I think I'm recommending my official recommendation for anybody watching this is that if you want to uplift uh, and you want to feel better, go watch a musical. Uh, there are plenty of them, and they're amazing. Um, uh, speaking of musicals, and you've been in, in a whole bunch of yourself, uh, including my wife's favorite musical of all time, mine, uh, you know, top five, uh, is Jesus Christ Superstar. You you played one of my favorite roles in that musical, uh, King Herod, which was awesome. And I saw I saw a bit of your performance, and it was uh, it was very 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 uh, well done. Uh, because it's not an easy character to play. It's not just the you know uh, comic relief. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, depth uh, to it, and it needs to be done properly. So uh, well done on that one. Oh, thank you. It's um that was the fun thing looking into that is is um, King Herod. And G he is the he's kind of the eleven o'clock uplifting number. Just take your mind off things before before everything gets bad for Jesus. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but looking at the the story of it, which actually we we keep, I always thought King Herod and Jesus Christ Superstar was the same Herod who was the slaughter of the innocents. It's not. It's one of his sons, mm -hmm. and excuse me, Herod Antipas, I think, and he was a um, he was a petty Roman dictator put in one one part of the country and. Uh, uh, but how how hugely threatened he just sort of doing the the look into the historical background of it how hugely threatened he was by these these religious upstarts who were going to take over what should have been his right i mean his father killed all his brothers and killed his mother and all sorts of lovely things so there is kind of a dark thing coming through it the the clip that's on youtube technically from the show doesn't show the end of the number but yeah. the the very end of the number was where we got to get nice and weird with it and uh, it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun. I sort of went, oh, King Herod. Okay, he's a fun song. That'll be fun. But once we, working with Desmac and up dig, digging the teeth into what it was really about was very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's, uh, what's a favorite musical that you've never been a part of, that you wish you were a part of? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, so many. Mm -hmm. uh, oddly, I want to direct the Pajama Game. Okay. Uh, which is random. Um, uh, I would love to, I'm getting to an age now where I could play it. I'd love to um, uh, play in a little night music. And uh, I'd also love to do Follies, which is a, a train wreck of a show. I've seen it a couple of times, but just the music is so glorious in that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, my life, my career has been so strange that mm -hmm. I sort of, I tend to look at most of my greatest experiences on stage have been surprises. So I tend to sort of, I, I, I started with that list of shows I wanted, wow, you're gonna get it all. Um, I started with the list of shows I wanted to do as a young actor and um, I was sort of anorexic and bulimic, I, sort of, I was anorexic and bulimic for a number of years trying to maintain the young, handsome, leading actor thing so I could play those roles. And it was very psychologically and physically unhealthy for me to do that. Um, and then I got to a point where I just went, I need to be healthy and I put on a lot of weight. And then a whole bunch of roles came at me that I'd never even thought of. Yeah. And I found a whole career as a character actor doing these wonderful, fulfilling parts. Um, and it was sort of at that point I went, okay, I don't really have to play Hamlet. I don't really have to play Prince Charming. I'm really loving the stuff I'm doing. So why don't I just see what the universe throws at me? And it's it's thrown some, you know, some wonderful parts I never would have expected. Um, you know, the the Dromeos in, in Comedy of Errors and um, uh, Trinculo in The Tempest and, and then other roles that just I never would have been cast in due to my physical stature, um, except by crazy directors playing the baker in Into the Woods and the MC in Cabaret. Mm -hmm. You don't look at this and think Joel Gray or Alan Cumming. And, <laughs> it's like different, yeah. 
it's, it's more of a, a, a Bruegel painting gone wrong in my case, um, <laughs> but it worked and it was, it was, that was weird. After those performances of Cabaret, I get a lot of people coming up and going, you were so fat. We thought you were going to be awful, but you were really good. Yeah. And you kind of had to edit the front half off, but you went, well, what I'm doing exactly, no, but it's a good thing. It was, it was a way of going, oh, you had a preconception and I could flip it on its head. So that was as as hard it was to hear the beginning part of it, it was also that's exactly why we were doing it. Yeah. So that you would see this part in a different way. And uh and whatever therapy those people need, they can find it for themselves. It's not my responsibility. So um yeah. so yeah. Um so looking at, at parts I want to play, I I sort of don't think like that anymore. I haven't in a long time. Now as I'm getting to a different look at age, I kind of go, oh, maybe I could play that. Maybe I could play that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'd also rather be gardening tomatoes. So I'm not really, there isn't that pressure of I have to do this before I die. I must have my bucket list of roles, you know. I get you. Um, yeah, the, the, coming back to a few things that you uh, you said that I want to uh, dive into, but you know, the back order, mm -hmm. back hand compliments are, are wonderful. Uh, as somebody who's Jewish, I've had uh, these compliments uh, a couple of times of, you're Jewish, but you're a nice guy. Okay. Oh <laughs> or, 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 oh, how lovely. I, I was teaching, um, I was teaching in the South and, uh, you know, uh, what I do for a living uh, that, that pays more than acting right now is uh, IT and HR consulting. So um, oh. I remember uh, teaching uh, somewhere in the southern of the United States. I don't remember if it was uh, if it was Tennessee or, or South Carolina, North Carolina. It was one of those. And then um, I had a really good class, and we spent you know a few days together. And at the end, one of the uh, one of the men came up and said, "Look, um, you're a really good guy. You know you're going to hell, right? Uh, because you're." <laughs> like, thank you. I, I appreciate that. So he was nice enough to hand me a Bible uh, because he was trying to, he was literally he was concerned like, for you. He was concerned for me. I appreciate that concern. It just, these, these compliments the, that make you think of, okay, thanks. I appreciate it. I love those. They're, they're, they're. I, I, uh, what I want to know is, is, well, um, no, I had a, I had a woman stop me at an entrance to a store and go, I, I work for a weight loss clinic and and you're you're going to have a heart attack and a stroke and you need to come to our clinic and it's and it I know but it's yeah. it's the weirdest I mean with stage or teaching even you're up in front of them they spend that time with you yeah. and they invest in you but we don't spend that time with them. That's true. So it's always it's always a surprise that they have a connection with someone they've never met or they feel. Um, but but with the religious question, I. I Jesus was a Jew. The Quran is based on Judaic mm -hmm. history and, you know, Abraham and Moses are all they're They're all part of the same wash bag. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it's the, I think it was really the dark ages that fucked us all up. I did a recently, um, I did a, a study group online with a guy who was talking about um, LGBT and the Bible. And really, Paul, St. Paul had some anti-Semitic things. Yay, Paul. And he had some, um, some anti-homosexual things in there. Um, but it wasn't really until the fourth century when somebody else with their own twisted sexual issues yeah. started going, that's a go to hell thing. And um, it's, uh, you just kind of go, why, why don't we just go back to, I, if I were to convert to anything, it would be Judaism because I could argue with God and that would be a very healthy relationship. <laughs> and uh you know, I'm sort of a, a vaguely Christian person right now, and that's all about peace and loving everybody. And that's what so many Christians in the United States aren't about these days. I, it's, that I don't understand. It's sad. I mean, the whole the whole let's divide ourselves into all sorts of different categories and subcategories. They're just we can feel protected and at the same time hate on everybody. What's the fucking point? Seriously, 
No, like, what is the point? That's not what religion talks about. Religion talks about tolerance. No. Religion talks about loving thy neighbor. Religion yes. talks about acceptance. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Uplifting each other, caring for each oh. other. Yeah. I, I could yeah. care less. Uh, I could care less if somebody is black, if they're white, if they're gay, if they're straight, if, what religion they are. Are you a good person? Are you uh, doing things that are helping the world uh, be a better place? Or are you an asshat? And that's, that's, that's kind of how I view it. One of my favorite words, ask that. It's so, it's so true. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, okay. yeah. Oh, but, uh, um, happy Pride Month, by the, by the way. That's, oh, uh, uh, thank you. I, we're all in isolation. And, and I was never, uh, well, I don't know. I remember the first what I perceive as having been the first Pride March in Vancouver when I was a kid and going on it. And it was, it was a political march. It was a, yeah. it was, it was, it was more of a, a political statement. And then over the years, it's just kind of become a big Mardi Gras party everywhere. And so I'm, I'm sort of hoping maybe this will get us to turn back to our roots and look at what we're talking about. But yeah, it's interesting, the isolation of groups and my, my, my opinion is so important. It's not really, you know, because your opinion isn't very different from your neighbors or my, it's like, you know, this um, one of the, we did some work with the Diana cast recently for um, uh, unconscious gender and race bias. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things is trying to acknowledge that we all have bias. It's part of our training and upbringing mm -hmm. to recognize it is part of it. And to also, when somebody says something that is, incorrect triggering whatever don't judge and don't put them in a category right away that may not be what they mean they may not have the syntax the vocabulary that you have yeah. so so it's to but right now everybody's so and i've had some students that are very trigger happy in it's the weaponizing of language and opinion and i'm this way and you need to treat me this way yeah, I'm this way and I treat everybody that way. So why are, take off your ass hat for five minutes? You exactly. know? Yeah. Yeah. No. I, and, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I, sorry. I found an object of, of that in, mm -hmm. in sort of what's happening online with, uh, with artists in this COVID isolation situation. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a panic for attention and getting likes on your postings and have I posted the right thing? Am I saying the right thing or am I not? Or, and it's, it's, there's a social anxiety of, of attention and approval that I find very unhealthy right now. Anyway, that's my grandpa opinion for the moment. Um, I, I agree with, uh, with your grandpa opinion. Uh, I think um at at our core we all want to be loved you know we as artists and actors we're, we're starving for attention we want it we crave it that's why we, we get into it in the right that's Social. a really healthy reason to get a profession yeah Don't love me yeah it's it's so ironic to me is that we got into this for attention and then acting is one of those industries where it's completely subjective and it's mostly rejection and it's not really even rejection it's mostly not even hearing anything you put your heart and soul into audition and then nothing and then nothing no it just passes by yeah yeah uh, i want to dive into uh kind of the mental health aspects of it and you've mentioned that you were anorexic right. bulimic and i think you you had that when you were uh, in your you know early 20s and mid 30s so you had it for a right. quite long period of time what made you uh, be able to overcome that and kind of get out of that mindset uh, because you've had it for so long? It's also um, it's also related to for me. I recently got a diagnosis of bipolar too, so it's um, uh, which uh, what the fuck does that mean? I don't know. Sorry for that swear word, but I do. What does that mean? It just means that you can play multiple characters. It's easier. I mean, it's it's exactly. Exactly. Um, the two in that means that I don't think I'm Napoleon. I just have really good days. Um, uh, but uh, but no, I have a tendency to depression and anxiety from sort of late teens on. Well, early childhood, I guess, if you go back to my relationship with my dad. But um, uh, part of it was was funny. It was the um, 
it started with anorexia because that was it, anorexia is all about control. Mm -hmm. It's not actually about it has a body dysmorphia element to it, but but for me it was what can I control in my life? Nothing. I can control what I put in my body. So mm -hmm. the only thing I put in my body was cigarette smoke and tab diet coke back in the day um and that and if i got to a certain weight i would be it was weird you'd get on the scale and if the scale was down i was a better person and if the scale had gone up i was a le less better person yeah. uh, there was a, a quantitative value to my personness based on what the scale would say um then i, I joke but i just got hungry um <laughs> and that's when i discovered bulimia when i could eat and gorge myself and 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 turn that control into what I kept in and what I kept out of my body. So it was um, panic compulsive eating has always been a big problem. Uh, still remains so, although it's better. Um, but you would eat whatever you wanted and then get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the I, I often talk about this, but the worst instance of that in my life was, was one year at Stratford. Um, I was on a roll with the bulimia and um, there was a Kentucky fried chicken across the street from a donut, Tim Hortons donut shop. And I layered chicken, donuts, chicken, donuts, chicken, donuts, so that I knew when it came out, when I hit the last layer of chicken, I knew I would be empty, which is just pathological when you think of it. Um, because I know people who have been through it and weigh their poop and weigh the food that goes in and weigh it's, it's a, it's a, Wow. fascinating distressing to me. what what got me to stop was actually vanity i um as a kid these two teeth which are pretty big athletic teeth anyway they were kind of buck so i had little little bunny rabbit teeth as a kid um and one day i was smiling in the mirror and they were kind of blue and i could almost see through them and that is the stomach acid coming up wearing yeah. down the dentin and pure vanity i just went I can't lose my teeth and I have to stop this. This is, and then I went, why am I doing this? And I went, cause I feel no control in my life and I'm depressed and I don't feel healthy. So it was kind of, <clears throat> kind of about getting healthy that made me put on all the weight. And um, I'm in a process of losing that now because now I'm older and it does make you unhealthy. Um, <clears throat> but it's, uh, but I have a healthier attitude towards it. But it was it was really vanity that made me stop. And well, uh, yeah. also uh, all those years of being skinny, I wasn't happy. So what the heck was I doing it for? That wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. the idea is if if I'm skinny, people will love me. Mm -hmm. Then I went, well, I'm I'm not. So why not have a sandwich? You know. <laughs> And then all the roles came, and then you started feeling, uh, you know, better about yourself. I've got all these parts that I just went, oh my god, I actually can work and be myself. And I think that's a. You talk to young actors in training, is very. It's more prevalent in the musical theater training that to type yourself. Uh, I know they still do it a bit in 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 acting schools, but um, I think it's beginning to break down now. But the whole idea of you have to fit a certain type in order to work had had both male and female actors and all gender actors doing things to their body to somehow conform to something they were not and my lesson was oh if i'm myself i will work more if i can accept who i am and look like what i look like i'll work and have experiences i couldn't expect you know, and be happy. Um, and be happy. Yeah. Er. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's always happy. a relative. Er. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Um, by the way, coming back to something else that I said when when I was kind of doing my uh, my research on you and uh, you know doing my deep dive and prep and you know looking at stuff you've done and listening to the interviews that uh, that you've uh, done, um, you there is there is something the depth uh within you and when you were singing uh, i just saw an interview that uh, that you did uh with uh, with a couple of other broadway uh, and uh, theater guys and when you were singing and uh, the camera was you know very close and looking at your eyes i couldn't think uh, or couldn't stop thinking of my god there's a lot of nathan lane there 
Um, and it's that same it's that same ability to emote and have the depth and the kindness. And there's just there was a lot of similarity. So um, that's what I kept coming back to. And then I thought, well, what roles would uh, that you haven't done? Because I started looking through your resume saying, oh, OK. Uh, and then I thought, well, he would be a great Tevye in uh, in um, in Fiddler on the Roof. Um, I thought that would be a nice fit. I thought you would uh, you would do really, really well in uh, producers. Uh, um, I thought um, producers is by by the way my favorite musical of all time. Um, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. That my second favorite musical of all time. I thought you would do great at as well, which is uh, uh, something rotten. Which as as soon as I saw something rotten, I'm like, where have you been all my life? This is like I I immediately looked up to see if Mel Brooks wrote it because it was so you know Mel uh, in terms of what this is. I'm like, this is. Really, good. I love it. It's it, it quickly just skyrocketed throughout. So I thought you'd be great in that. So I, I started looking at things that you haven't done. Think, yeah, 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 yeah. So lots oh, of wow. things. Thank to you. Be my new agent. Um, <laughs> I uh, I uh, I would love to play Tevi at some point. I'm I'm not Jewish. I am circumcised. Um, but uh, my step grandfather was Jewish, and he. Um, Fascinating sidebar story. Mm -hmm. He went to the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music. Wow. Uh, Prince Yusupov, who shot Rasputin, was one of his best friends. Um, but from his, I have his certificate from the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music, and it's this huge wall hanging almost with all these Russian composer teachers' names on it. But it says this is to sort of all in Russian. This is to certify that Myron Jacobson, and then after his word name is a Russian word that means he's not one of us, but he's okay. Oh, God. There's an actual word for it in Russian. And that's that's heartbreaking, but it's also, it's like, wow, good for him. What he must have gone through yeah. musically and, and as a young talent to struggle to be seen yeah. when they were gonna tag your graduation certificate with that. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to do it in, in, in um, I was going to think, who's going to let an old fag play Tevia? But but Harvey Weinstein, uh, Harvey and Harvey Weinstein, no Harvey Firestein, <laughs> wrong, wrong Harvey, wrong Harvey, take that back, <laughs> toxic Harvey, whoop whoop, yeah. Yep. Um, but um, no, I'd love to. I, I met. No, that's a great compliment. I met Nathan Lane very briefly. I don't think he would remember. He came to see a show at Stratford, um, and just a sweet gentle soul he's so broad in his comedy and so strong and aggressive and yet he has that tenor so that's a that's a huge compliment yeah, yeah. la cage a is another one um i oh, just that's what i'd love to do either either role george or albert i'd love to do that um we was... should do that together let's do it absolutely it's, it's it's one of those like um you know I'm, I'm a straight man uh but i have you know i'm in theater and i'm acting and i have so many gay friends it feels like to me it, it doesn't like it's completely um, permeated my my existence where I don't think about it, and then when people point it out and they're saying, "Well, it's this," and like it, it's it's not normal. I, I don't know. It's okay. But well, it's, no, but a beautiful thing about that show is that for me, it's a it's a um, although it's often dismissed as sort of oh Jerry Herman fun silly Broadway. It's it's. Um, where people get hung up on homosexuality is about the sex act. Um, but when you see a story like that, it's a love story. It is. It's, a, it's not about the genitals. It's about two people in love and a family. They love their son yeah. and they want their best for their son and they love each other and they love their work and the artists they work with. And it's all about love. And it's, it doesn't reduce it to what happened? What do you do with your weeby in private? It's like, Cares. I I, who cares? Yeah. yeah. Um, Birdcage, uh, the movie. I, I just had my oh. kids watch uh, Birdcage recently. To me, it's um, even. I, I think I saw Birdcage. Uh, you know, I don't know if I saw it immediately when it came out, but I saw it a right. long time ago. And the first kind of uh, few minutes, you're still thinking of, okay, these are two men, uh, and then you completely forget about it because. 
it's just a relationship between two people. There's so much heart and soul to it. Yes. Um, it is an incredible, uh, incredible movie. So yeah. uh, one of my favorites of all time, and both of them, uh, just incredible, uh, incredible performance of just sharing who they are as people with each other. That's what that movie is about. You, yeah. you please, I don't know, if anybody looks at it and they're, they, they are still hung up on these are two men, is missing the point and the heart of the whole thing. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Again, it's what we come back to is that is that isolation. My particular point of view validates. There's a fear of not feeling valid. I think I'm trying to figure out what makes people crazy. Yeah. Everything does, but but the sort of my point of view is valid. Therefore, yours can't be. And it's like no, multiple things can happen. Yeah. Trans women can be women, and yet. The experience of cisgender women is its own unique experience and sociological experience. So mm -hmm. both can exist simultaneously without diminishing each other. It's, um, it's feeling safe and feeling protected and feeling like, okay, I found my tribe and yes, my tribe and that's my truth. Uh, there is truth is a very wide spectrum and everybody has their own. Uh, there is not one thing that's uh, that's real and the other thing yeah. is not beautiful thing about this world is that it's all a buffet. You know, everybody takes what is right for them. And that's what, you know, adds to all the tapestry of life. That's the point. It's not just one thing is right and everybody else is wrong. Everybody in their own way is right. And, and one good thing about this COVID thing is it's showing that tribe walls mean nothing. Good. Yeah. You know, we're, we're all getting it. We're all Say yes. to varying degrees and threatened by it in varying degrees and just because you believe x or y doesn't mean you're immune from it yeah, yeah. Um, um last thing on this and then and we'll move on because we're very serious it's good no it's good um, we're solving the world's problems in in you know with uh with what's happening and the protest and black lives matter uh which yeah. they of course they do <laughs> oh, okay uh but well, it's gonna put it be i saw all lives can't matter until black lives matter yeah. yeah yeah and and they really have been and and uh waking up to the idea that uh we don't have to ask black people what they need we've known all along and just ignored it yeah. and that's so it's time to just step up to the plate and stop being dicks you know pretty, yeah. pretty much yeah. yeah i saw i saw you know on instagram there's a ton of stuff uh which a lot of it is, is wonderful and the thing that struck me so so deeply is two bags of uh, two identical bags of blood, and saying, "Hey, uh, you know, white racist, uh, you need some blood. Pick the white one." That's it, right? We're yeah. all the same. Get the fuck over it, seriously, yeah. people. We're all the same, and yeah. uh, black people right now are not treated the same, and they should be treated no. the same. So as yeah. Uh, Friends, uh, uh, women, it, 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 everybody should be treated the same. That's the point. We're all people. Get over it. Okay, moving on. Okay. No, uh, exactly. And that takes us back to our whole faith thing. It's all the same. Just, just love, love each other. Love yourself. Take care of everybody. Yeah. I think the one of the beautiful parts of acting, getting back into the the acting, mm. but when when we're acting, we have a chance to be all of these different people. Uh, when you act, you have a chance, you know, or you're a straight man, you have a chance to be, uh, to play somebody who's not. Uh, you have a chance to experience because you have to be within your partner's eyes. You have a chance to understand what is their emotion and what's happening when you're a woman, when you've been persecuted, when you're about to That's be executed. It. And we have a chance to experience all of these things. So I don't know if actors you know, because we're artistic, because we're, you know, more right brain versus left brain, maybe we're more accepting anyway, or is it because we get a chance to play with so many and experience so much to understand that, hey, we're accepting because everybody is the same. I don't know if it's acting, if it's just the way we're wired. I've, I've always looked at, at the theater as a, as a secular temple where we talk about yeah. the issues that affect human the human condition and we we put ourselves in the roles of people different from ourselves to show an audience does any of this speak to you do you see a commonality with this even though this is completely 
you know, you're head of gambler and you're going to go shoot yourself in the next room. Have you ever felt that kind of isolation and and loss that puts you in that? So it's we find a commonality of, of discussion just for what it is to wake up every morning and be human. Um, but I think it's I think it's the 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 greater journey of the theater is to do that. Um, I'm hoping things will turn around a bit. I think it's been great. People, the, the theater of the last few years has really pushed the pendulum, but in some ways it's pushed it, I think, to that isolation. It's my, my thing is more important than your thing is more important than, and I'm hoping we can get back to, not back to, forward to a new, uh, a new broader discussion of all these issues, but without weaponizing them, you know? Yeah, well, the younger people are, the more black and white they think uh, they are. And it's we're not talking color. We're just thinking, you know, in terms of yeah. ideology, or either this or that. It's not. It's, mm -hmm. it's all encompassing. But yeah, hopefully we get there. Um, yeah. speak, uh, speaking of uh, of uh, stage, uh, you've been on Broadway. You've been on Canadian uh, soil. Uh, you're both Canadian and American and U.S. citizen, um, which is awesome. I think yeah, I love Canadian. I have so many Canadian friends. Um, What's the difference that you have found between uh, Broadway production and a Stratford uh, production? You know, what are some of the major differences? Um, the most obvious major difference is um, Stratford has really nice dressing rooms uh, and lots of space. Um, it's uh, people are always surprised to get into a Broadway theater. It's um, I always describe Broadway as Newton's third law of physics, which is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So for every star glittery champagne opening night, you have rats in the dressing room, <laughs> you know, or there's a, right, right now for Diana, it's not nobody's fault. It's the theater was built in 1856. It wasn't, it was built turn of the century, 1900, turn of the last century. Oh my God, I'm old. Um, but uh, but we've got five grown men in a dressing room that's basically six feet by ten feet, include nodding like, and then the the our our desks come out from the wall from that. So there's literally like we cannot sit at a desk opposite the at our dressing station opposite the other person, and both if we're both in our chairs, we can sit there. But we can't, if one has to get up, you have to say, excuse me, and the other has to shift and you have to shift your chair. It's a, it's a total Jenga dressing room. Um, and there's another story about one of the other theaters. Somebody said, oh, if you're going to work at that theater, you go to your dressing room, you knock on the door, you flick the light on and off three or four times, close the door again, count to 10. By then the roaches will be gone and you can go in your dressing room. Okay. Um, I okay. thought you were going to, uh, into some ghosts being, uh, you know, inhabiting the theater. <laughs> oh, wait, you haven't even touched on them yet. They're a whole other story. But no, it's just, um, and when we did Jane Eyre uh, at the Brooks Atkinson, the previous show had gone under and they just stuffed the set in the basement. They didn't have enough money to move the set out. And mm -hmm. there was an explosion in the rat population. So they came into the theater and killed all the rats but they couldn't get their little rat corpses out from underneath the set in the basement. And the basement was our only crossover. So okay. the whole building stunk of rotting rat. And so you're in this glamorous Broadway musical, but backstage smells like dead rat. Um, so there's, there's that Stratford doesn't have that problem. <laughs> um, but, but the inverse is that, that um, I mean, Stratford has a huge audience. I don't know how many, uh, like 700, 800,000 patrons a year, uh, huge annual budget, four plus theaters uh, doing 14 to 17 productions a year. It's a huge thing. It's the only place outside of the Metropolitan Opera where everything is built on site, wigs, jewelry, shoes, awesome. and boots. Oh, it's amazing. They, the most exciting part of Stratford for me is the uh, artisans and craftspeople to, to go in and have a pair of periods uh, restoration silk slippers made for you and 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 layered with glue and baked and they're they're astounding people um, 
but but there isn't generally in Canada there is not the we're we're one tenth of the population so there isn't that audience base we can't really have a star system up here people are known for mm -hmm. working consistently and and a few rise to the top on if they hit sort of an international level thing um, but it's not it's sort of the whole nature of the business itself is very different. It's I largely non-for-profit, very little commercial work up here. And um, again, I'm my career, as, as small as it has been to this point, uh, has been primarily on screen. Uh, I love Broadway. I love theater, but uh, I work full time. I have a family. So on screen and shorts and indies are the only things that I <clears throat> seem to have time for. <clears throat> or co-stars or guest stars. I'm happy to change everything if I get one of them. Please, a series regular. I'm there. OK. Right. But, um, um, that said, um, I've always heard, uh, and I wanted to ask you this question because we always do kind of a reality check question. Um, what's what is it like in terms of the difference in uh, in getting paid? And you've done on screen uh, stuff, and you've done uh, you know a lot of on stage. So, is there a huge difference? Uh, is one a lot more lucrative than another? You mean stage versus film? Yeah. Oh, it, it, or TV oh, or. Uh, always media is pays way better than stage and i wish i'd figured that out about four <laughs> years ago yeah um yeah i i, I was oh, i love the stage i love the live performance i my bank account's empty why am i no i mean i i um i uh i've had a very good career and things are going very well it's still a good career but i've had a couple of years there where i mm -hmm. i won two acting prizes in toronto and sort of consecutive years and both of those years i was living below the poverty line so it's because it was it was theater and those were the only two projects that happened in that two-year span so um so it's it's and it's it's because there isn't the market it's not like most new york actors work outside new york they don't work in the city mm. they live in new york they audition they go out do regional stuff and come back um there's there's a lot of regional work to be had here but it's more literally regional and so it's harder to shift from from area to area okay. um yeah i mean calgary is a great theater center and i've i've loved working there and i love the community there but i'm not a calgary actor so they're not going to bring me in from toronto to do work that a calgary actor could do whereas there seems to be more national travel for actors in the states um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that reality check. Um, and in terms of the various uh, roles that you've played, because you've you've done Shakespeare and you've done Cabaret and you've done kind of everything in between, um, what is your acting approach like? Are you approaching these varied roles in the same manner, uh, or are you treating them differently? Um, I had some great teachers at university. I was very lucky to work with and. For me, uh, acting is acting. You have a set of given circumstances, as Stanislavski would say, or you have information, which gives you an impulse to respond. There's an intake of breath, and then you act. And that is exactly the same whether you're doing a Shakespeare play, a musical, a contemporary drama, a piece on film, a, a cartoon voice what it is is the world of the play dictates the manner in which you communicate so um i was trying to explain to somebody this sorry I'm morning my nose runs it's a damn cocaine problem no it's not <laughs> i'm kidding it's uh it's literally just i wake up and my nose runs because it needs something to do um because the rest of me ain't running um uh <laughs> it, i was trying to explain this to somebody that if you look at it and this is ludicrous but it's true um, if you look at to be or not to be, it happens on or about the inciting incident of the play. And uh, for Hamlet, it happens on or about that inciting incident. And he has that moment of psychological reflection and foreshadows what his intention for the play will be, his objective, what he's, his goal is, his horizon, whatever you want to call it. If you look at Roger and Hammerstein's Cinderella, on or about the inciting incident of the play she has in my own little corner in my own little chair 
which yeah. states her psychological reality and foreshadows what will become her intention or objective. It is the exact same moment for characters that could not be any different, yeah. artistically different more. Yeah. And so anyone who says Shakespeare is boring and inaccessible hasn't looked at the moments and anybody who looks at musical theater as light, frivolous and meaningless, it, in my own little corner is to be or not to be. Yeah. It is the same moment. So for me, for the actor, it's what's the information? What's the impulse? Where am I in the dramaturgical structure of the play? What do I have to play right now? Mm -hmm. um, but how does my character communicate? They communicate through song. They communicate through movement. Uh, they communicate through blank verse, rhyming couplets. Uh, is it Moliere? You're in a six, six foot rhythm beat with always rhyming couplets. That's the world you're in. That's the way your mind works. But for me, acting is acting. Okay, thank you. It's, it's good to hear. Um, is it... And also just to, one more thing with that, it's it's also audience perspective. Are you in a 20,000 yes. seat stadium? Is it a 400 seat theater or is it on camera and I'm talking to you? So yeah. it's where your audience is simply changes the perspective on what you're giving. And then um, in terms of uh, kind of the structure, right? Because when you're doing a play, you're starting at the beginning and then you go through the end and the next day you're doing that same thing. So the discovery and everything else is uh, is one way. When you're on screen, uh, you're shooting things out of sequence. You're shooting them over and over again. Um, do you find yourself, again, approaching it the same way or uh, changing when you go on screen, your approach is uh, you know, varying in order to address those uh, differences? Um, as an actor, if I'm hearing you right, I approach it the same way. But what's really important, that's when the structure of the piece comes in. Mm -hmm. A five act play for Shakespeare, three act play for Tennessee Williams, it's still the same structure. Yeah. A three act television drama that happens in a one hour still has its three acts. So where am I in that process? What information do I have? Where in the journey am I? Where is the climax? Where is the cathartic moment? And going even out of order, I can go, oh, I'm in the middle of act two. So mm -hmm. I have a certain amount of information and a certain amount of information yet to find. My choices can only be based around these sort of ideas. Perfect. Thank you. That, um, that's better. Um, and it uh, clarifies uh, things a little bit. And I know, you know there are a lot of uh, my friends who are doing a lot of stage who are <clears throat> starting to audition on screen or war <laughs> before every kind of stuff. Um, you know, this is very useful information to them. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, okay, let's uh, let's get into lyrics because uh, lyrics uh, oh. lyrics is I don't know. If if I had nothing else that I could do, it would be uh, it would be writing poetry and lyrics. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the one of the uh, one of the plays that you were in, uh, a Midsummer Night's uh, Dream. Um, I saw it at Chicago Shakespeare Theater uh, in 2000, I think. Uh, I went there, I was, uh, I was in college, I went there, I saw it, it blew my mind. I came home and I wrote uh, this two-page uh, uh, kind of Shakespearean review in uh, what sounds Shakespearean to me in terms of uh, prose, it may not be, not prose, it's uh, poetry, so it's uh, you know, like, yeah. uh, proper rhythm. And I wrote it and I sent it off to them. I said, look, this is this is a review. This is a, you know, a testimonial. Use it any way you like. Uh, of course, they right. never used it, but I, I still have it. And it's to me, it, uh, it, it it's a revelation. So, you know, my default is I'm going to sit down. If I feel inspired, I'm going to sit down and write. I do the same thing with lyrics. I have a Broadway, uh, you know, song that I wrote. I have a hip hop song that I wrote. My daughter you know, was uh, was in middle school, so I wrote a Disney pop uh, thing. It's oh, beautiful. All sorts of genres, uh, just because it feels this way, and I do it. So, how did you become a lyricist? Uh, how did that start, and what was your inspiration for it? Um, it, I sort of came through it through the composing route. I took piano for twelve years, and um. I've now lost all my piano playing skills, but I can still write at a level higher than I can play, which is 
immensely frustrating because people say, play one of your songs. I was like, I can't. Um, the computer can, but I can't. Um, and then it, uh, you know, it was puberty and and trying to trying to express what I was feeling, and um, sort of bringing that forward. And then and then it was later learning how to structure a lyric or how to tell a story through which. I mean, Shakespeare is so lucky. He gets to write in verse and take all the time he wants. Yeah, uh, he doesn't. Ha he doesn't have thirty-two bars to get it right. Yep. Um, and so I've sort of, and then I sort of uh, really jonesed out and got excited by the work of um, Alfred Edward Hausman, A. E. Hausman. Mm. He, if you love lyrics, look, he writes poems. He wrote poems. Um, a Shropshire Lad is sort of his best known collection of poems. Um, but he writes what was, oh, whoa, shoot, there's a term for it. Um, oh, I've lost the term. Uh, but it's it's a simple verse writing. It's very, it's almost like, uh, well, his, his um, oh, how does it start? The loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for Easter tide. Now, mm -hmm. of my threescore years and 10, 20 yeah. will not come again. Yeah. Take from 70 years a score, it leads me only 50 more. And since to look at things in bloom, 50 years is little room, about the woodland I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. It's immensely profound, but yeah. so simple. And that's kind of, for me, the trick to lyrics, but it's fun. Like you said, I, I I started writing this show called Bitch Island that was a huge hit at the fringe, and we're trying to get a producer for it, but it's very on the edge. It's pro me too, but pro me too movement, but it's also at the same time a musical celebration of these exploitation seventies women in prison movies. So it's uh, okay. It's a it's a hard sell, um, uh, but the whole idea is to get straight men to look at what we ask women to do in cinema and why why is that woman topless there is no reason for her to be topless yep. except for mm -hmm. our titillation so anyway it asks those questions it's really funny script anyway but writing that i had to write like 80s 70s 80s pop songs which is not like the 70s and 80s i was listening to 40s show tunes so uh so it, it was a different world for me it's it's fun um so yeah the lyrics kind of came around ass backwards but it's it's i'm only beginning to realize now what an incredibly challenging art form it is and an exciting art form yeah um yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me so for you is it um music or lyrics <clears throat> if you had to choose uh, one or the other which one would it be <laughs> Um, no, I, I'm I'm going mm. to be a poo head and say both, because for me I love music, yeah. but music without lyrics is its own experience. Music with lyrics is its own experience, and I love poetry, mm. but poetry without music is its own experience. So so it's it, for me they they come hand in hand, and it's really fun and hard. The melody goes that way, where where can the words go with it to make sense that needs to make sense? Or does the melody have to expand and does that destroy the melody? Or is the lyric destroyed by squishing it into too tight a space? It's uh, that's another sort of Jenga thing that's loads of fun. Yeah, um, I found, and again, you know, uh, I haven't been asked to write anything for Broadway. So <clears throat> when uh, the- Yet. 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 The operative word is yeah, um, but when I had that you know kind of uh, Broadway number that was flowing through me, the way that I wrote it is I needed to have a rhythm, I needed to have a structure. You know, some songs, uh, uh, not necessarily songs, but some lyrics I write, I have this kind of uh, you know a um, a tango uh, temper or a waltz uh, yes. playing in yeah. my head. Um, for the Broadway one, uh, there is a famous Russian kind of song. So for whatever reason, that started playing in my head, and I wrote the lyrics with that in mind. So right. it flows, uh, and it has that right energy 
uh, that uh, that uses it. So you know, I can say for me, the answer to the question music or lyrics for me is probably if I had to choose one, I would choose lyrics because that's that's here. Uh, right. But I can't write the lyrics without the music, <laughs> and so I need the music in order to help me uh, inspire. Yeah. My music, so. Well, it blows my mind that Oscar Hammerstein wrote all of those shows, book and lyrics, yeah. and then sent them off to Richard Rogers to write the tunes to. But that's because Oscar Hammerstein had such a natural innate understanding of music that he knew if I set this up, we'll get something like that back. Yeah. Like that's but he's, he's a greater, greater mind than mine, you know. Yeah. Um, do you have anything of yours uh, in terms of lyrics? Because uh, in my prep, I dove in and I would you know, I know that you're a lyricist and I wanted to, you know, to listen to some, uh, to some things and I couldn't find stuff online. Do you have any uh, of your lyrics that we can uh, hear? I, I, I pulled up one, um, okay. which is really strange because this, you know, this song musically began as an entirely different song. Um, uh, but um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a British novel uh, from the early 20s called Enchanted April. And it was made into a film, uh, and then there's been a stage version. And I've been working with the uh, uh, Matthew Barber got a Tony nomination for best play for his adaptation of it. And we've been working on a, a musical version of it. Um, but um, the it's about four women who don't know each other at the beginning of the story come together to rent an Italian villa. It's right after World War One. Okay. Uh, World War One being the only war that people came back from Maine. They mm -hmm. came back. Nobody ever came back from a war before, mm -hmm. um, and certainly not chopped up the way they did. So, so these women have their own traumas post-war and their dreary life in England, and they want to take a break for themselves, leave their husbands and go, and not leave their husbands, but just I need this for me, and which was not a thing that women did in the time. Um, so they rent uh they rent this Italian villa in San Salvatore. And um so this is actually uh they're going to the man to get the keys to pay him okay. and and he sings back, um he describes the story of the villain and how it came into be in his family. And um uh I don't know if you want it sung or spoken. Um it's all my material. Um, I'll take um, either whatever whatever you want to do right now. It's it's very interesting because it's a it's a weird little melody. So it's um, <clears throat> San Salvatore, a modest castle on a hill, a modest ter. So nervous. Um, San Salvatore, a modest castle on a hill. A modest terrace drenched in sunlight, sloping gently to the sea. And like all castles, it has a story all its own. My father's parents had it built to see their loved proclaimed in stone. A kind of fable, some kind of statement to the world, their love eternal. I can't go with you, I work in Rome, you'll see it for me. Perhaps you'll write me of all the flowers. And then it sort of goes on. Um, a modest castle. It's it sort of it sort of flows. It's an interesting structure. Yeah. I'm not a big rhyme guy. Rhymes pop in or pop in internally, but I'm not a yeah. Uh, yeah, it follows the same same thing and, and sort of keeps going. Um, it's very um, lovely. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to no, say. No, no, interrupt. No. Yeah, it's it's very oh, lovely. It's very visual. Uh, it's visual because you you uh, the imagery is flowing. So I I really like that aspect. It's uh, he's basically describing how it came into his family. Uh, they built it to, and it's, it's fascinating because eventually these women will find their way back to their loves in their lives or find new love through being there. Um, so it's the, the castle was actually built to represent his parents' love or his grandparents' love. And, um, and he's sort of saying how he's never been attached to it, never been a part of it. 
how it meant one thing to his mother, how it meant something else to his father. And it actually just came right out of a monologue that's in the play. I mean, Matthew's play is so beautifully written. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, eee, that's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's, thank you. it's yeah. our, our privilege. Um, yeah, that's very, very cool. I, I love lyrics. It's, uh, mm. yeah. Do you have somebody you write with? Do you have a... a no, uh, I don't. I wrote, so uh, one of the later things that I wrote is I had this, and I think uh, it was it was a bit of the Me Too movement, but for uh, for whatever reason, I got inspired and I wrote this jazz number that I imagine being sung by a, uh, a black uh, a jazz singer with an incredible voice. And it's this uh, powerful song about having to choose between two men and then finally choosing herself instead. And uh, it's it's called uh, uh, Door One or Door Two. And I wrote it. And then I, I sent it off to uh, to a couple of, uh, you know, wonderful performers who are, you know, great. And they're incredible vocal right. and uh, never heard anything back. So I'm kind of in, in my in terms of my writing, because I have uh, no uh, no connections uh, elsewhere. It's more I write it and then it just sits. Like uh, the, um, you know what? It's such a hard thing. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, tell me to stop being your mother at any point, but I do no, tend no. to turn into mama bear occasionally. Um, yeah. Is is oh, we do that? And I I remember um, uh, we're receiving fan mail for all sorts of shows, or receiving letters, or things, or could you read my play, or whatever. Um, I think too many artists look for somebody to help make it real. Uh, find somebody closer to home who wants yeah. to write some songs and then do it together, whatever, get that set. Yeah. There's, you've got such a cabaret. Uh, there's, there's so many cabaret artists in Chicago. Start on that scale and 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 get the word. And then people will want to, like Tom Lehrer wrote songs for himself. To perform for fun at university and then realize there was a career in it so it's yeah. um but it's very often stuff will get lost in stage door you go i've got 14 letters and oh this is somebody's lyric now i'm sure it's great i don't know what to do with it either yeah. you know yeah so so don't be discouraged by that but i totally understand feeling in that bubble of yeah. i'm sending this stuff out and nobody's hearing it <laughs> yeah um yeah no, it took me for. There's a company here that's that's is a wonderful musical theater company, and it's it's because I'm known as an actor. Mm -hmm. It's taken me ages to like throw stuff at them and go, no, I write musical theater. And yeah. finally, they said, you know, we really get that you are writing musical theater. Okay, we will look at you differently. And yeah. that was a huge, but it it took years for fucking ever. Pardon the French again. Um, you know, and it does. You gotta you gotta beat them over the head, but um. But it is it, to send it to somebody you think they're going to look at it if there's a YouTube link of somebody else doing it. So yeah. so find a find a writer nearby to set some of your stuff to music, you know. OK, so uh, anybody, if you're watching and if you're a, a composer um, or if you're a singer, come talk to me. We, we have uh, loads of Dude. stuff. To <laughs> Dude. He's Perfect. adorable and fun to talk with. So I think you should get in touch with him. Thank Why you. all of a sudden I become Jewish for that? I don't know, but there we go. Thank Call you. this man. Yes, and do it very quickly. Um, very quickly, yes. Well, um, last, uh, last thing, and I know you have, uh, you have uh, a lot of things ahead of you this morning, so I appreciate you taking your time for it. Not really. <laughs> no? Okay, I thought you had rehearsal. Yeah. Re rehearsal coming up uh, at oh, the... I've got, a, I, I've got to teach a class at 12. Yeah, so okay. yeah, I do. But okay. uh, um, yeah. last, uh, last question then, and I ask all of our actors uh, that uh, same question, uh, the only question that repeats uh, in all of the interviews for the actors. Um, if you were able to give one bit of acting advice to a younger acting version of yourself, what would that advice have been? Oh, wow. Um... Uh, it'd be a two-parter. Okay. 
Um, the big one that's over, over said and never heard is you are enough. Yeah. Don't have to change yourself. You don't have to change your body. You don't have to try to fit a mold. You don't have to. There's so much bad how to audition advice out there right now. It drives me crazy. Um, do I have to do this to do the audio? No, just you are enough. Do the work. That's enough. Tied to that, the way to be enough, have a hobby that has nothing to do with theater or music or art or literature. Take up fishing, take up bird watching, take up hiking, take up a new language, take up something. Have something that fulfills you as a per get involved in the community, have a volunteer position at something that's not necessarily a theater or an art gallery. Mm -hmm. Do something that fulfills you as a person outside of this art because it's so easy to be sucked into the vortex of needing validity online, needing social media hits, needing to explore yourself to explore the art. You can just disappear up your own butt and you can't give as an artist unless you are a whole person and i've been doing this a long time and i'm still not a whole person i'm still working at it i wish i'd known to have something else that fulfills me and the the sort of noble idea behind artists that it's the only thing that fulfills me mm. is really self-destructive you have a family you have children you have your other career that 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 gives you life and breath and food and and but this whole, uh, it's my only, no, that's not healthy. Yeah. So that's, that's how I ended starving and barfing and nearly losing my teeth was trying to let that be all everything. It also diminishes your work. It, it closes in your scope of what you can offer to the world. So, so grow some tomatoes. That's my advice. Perfect. Thank to myself. you. Thank you so oh, much. My um, pleasure. You're a doll. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope that. we'll talk more. And I want to hear more of your lyrics. We gotta, we'll, we'll talk later sometime. Yeah. Uh, I have some. If you have a few more minutes, if you want, I can read some. Sure. Please do. I'm not, I'm not going to sing it. My, I, I, have a, I have a wide vocal range, but it's like Swiss cheese with a lot of holes in it. So, um, <clears throat> But I'm teaching a class online with that. There's a thing out of uh, Graham Abbey from Stratford is doing it, uh, ghostlight.ca. Uh, we're doing a lot of online free classes. Um, and uh, uh, Shauna McKenna is teaching one on Shakespeare. Dion Johnstone's doing one on Shakespearean rhetoric. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing one on singing for actors who are not singers. If really? you want to go into the audition and just yeah. be comfortable with your voice, that's what this class is about. So. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, ghostlight.ca is a great it's a great resource too. Yeah. So um, well, anyway, I'll, well, I'll look it up and I'll link it so uh, so people have access Perfect. to it. Uh, all right, your choice. I can uh, I can give you one of my songs. I can give you my Shakespeare review that I was talking about for the Midsummer Night's Dream. Which one do you want? I I trust your judgment. All right. So this way I'm not going to sing. So I'm going to do the uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, uh, I, I watched it uh, on February 21st of 2000. So I called it the Midwinter Night's Dream. Why do I love it? Let me count the ways. Shakespeare has seen no finer days with people flocking left and right to hear his wisdom and his plight. I was astonished and confused, but rather pleasantly amused when I looked up into the seats and saw them being filled with kids. My God, I thought on Wednesday night, Shakespeare to blame for this delight? Since when has William come of age, and when did he become the rage? While pondering on this and that, Fock ran across the stage and sat. He screamed, he flirted, and he laughed while sporting an enormous shaft. No, not the kind you have in mind, the plastic guy. Oh, never mind. Well, anyway, his clothes suggest that he's a fairy of the past, exactly what I thought he'd wear with just a little bit less hair. And then the strangest thing took place. Men and a woman showed their face. They wore black suits. The modern kind, they Donna Karen, Hugo, mine. They puckered Puck onto the stage and dressed him in the latest rage. Here, standing Puck with hair bound, transformed into a royal hound. Next thing you see is carpet red being applied to stages set. You see more men all wearing dark, portraying secret service sharks. And then 
from everywhere around on every floor you hear these sounds when sounds get clear you do see more folks are dressed like you and me they are all screaming waving signs and they are coming into lines but all of them are not on stage instead from audience their numbers fled the signs are reading words of praise to duke and duchess they are raised and here the royalty comes in so show is ready to begin the duke is sporting a nice tux while duchess's business deluxe they are so modern and so bright you wonder if your ticket's right perhaps you're at a fashion show where shakespeare only heaven knows but lines dismantled words to fly to talk of summer's favorite night you shortly recognized the verse since players started to converse. You were now firmly in their grasps as they manipulate his gasps, changing their ways from new to old, never for once leaving you cold. I'd be a fool to tell you more because this play opens the door to childlike happiness and fun that rings so dear to everyone. I highly recommend this play. Shakespeare has seen no finer day. Instead of kissing up to few, the players open up to you no matter if Shakespeare's your friend, you will enjoy it till the end. Whether midsummer or midfall, don't hesitate and make the call. Take the advice you hear from me for genius, these mortals will be. Oh, okay. Anybody watching this? This little adorable young dude speaks Russian, Ukrainian, and writes in English with more understanding of the depth and intricacies of our ludicrous language than anybody mm -hmm. like that blows my mind that's fabulous Thank no you. i mean you've got not only the rhythm but the wordplay and all the rest of it um uh the, and, and and it's not your mother tongue and you speak two other languages <laughs> that use the cyrillic alphabet that blows my mind uh yeah. i appreciate that that's no that, that's that's, that's I studied French all my life and I can barely order a grilled cheese sandwich, you know, <laughs> and that makes me weep. So yeah, no, wait, that's cool. That's beautiful. They should have <laughs> used that. Like dummies. I thought so. I mean, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Uh, the most frustrating part, by the way, coming from uh, from Russia to or, or former Soviet Union, I come from a country that no longer exists. Um, oh, yeah. The most frustrating part for me in not knowing enough English was that I was a poet there. So it was a part of my identity and I could share that with people. And now I have all of these things that I cannot share. I learned English in order to share my poetry with people. Oh my God. So that was, that That's was. A, a stop movie. whining about your high school English class, kids. Yeah, yeah. Suck exactly. it up and work. Yeah, oh my God, amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Thank you for staying with us. Um, you know, be kind to one another. That's that's what the world needs right now. That's what the world needed before. And that's what the world will need from every one of us in the future. Thank you.